Today we are going to continue our conversation about electrochemistry and we are going to cover electrolytic cells. Um, we are going to see some examples of electroplating problems and we are going to just do a brief uh, um, coverage of um, corrosion problems. So let's go over the properties of galvanic or also called voltaic cells and electrolytic cells and what's different between the two and what's the same. So first of all, <clears throat> one important difference is the type of reaction that's happening. Uh, for uh, the gal galvanic or voltaic cells, the reaction is spontaneous and can be used to produce electricity. So we have the conversion of chemical energy into electric energy. For uh, electrolytical cells, we have non-spontaneous reaction that would happen only if we provide the energy. So our electric energy coming out of the plug is going to be used to produce chemical energy. Um, for galvanic cells, it's um, really critical that the two solutions, the two half cells, are separated to avoid mixing. Otherwise, you basically would have a short circuit um, of the of the cell, so they need to be in different containers, and but then you need to ensure um, electrical continuity, a connection through a porous set or through a salt bridge. While for electrical cell, electrolytic cells, even if sometimes, like the one we use for the um, demonstration um, in our department, that uh, you will not see because we are online, but that would have still separated, but it's not critical. In fact, the one that you will see in the movie that's associated with the lab um, is is not the two compartments are not separated. Um, so it's is not is not a requirement. What um, it's identical is what's written here in blue. So at the anode, you have the oxidation in both type of cells. And at the cathode, you have the reduction in both type of cells. What's different is going to be the sign that's associated with, e with each of the two cells. In a galvanic cell, the anode is negative because that's where the oxidation is happening spontaneously. So it's rich of electrons. And those electrons are driven towards the cathode where they are attracted by the reduction that's happening spontaneously there. While <clears throat> in the electrolytic cells, we are uh, forcing a reaction of oxidation. So um, we are forcing basically the electrons to come out from the species that gets in oxidized. And for this reason, the anode needs to be positive to extract those electrons while the cathode is going to be negative so we can force those electrons into the, the, the space that's going to be reduced so uh, basically the galvanic cell is a battery so you're inside the battery while with the electrical cells you are outside the battery So um, here you see a representation of an electro, uh, electrolytic cells. So you, you know immediately that you have an electric, uh, electrolytic cells because you can see um, that there is a source of energy. So in this case, it's a battery, so it's continuous um, current. And you can identify the positive side of the battery uh, because it's the longest of the of the segments at the shorter segments that's also typically thicker is at the negative side um, <clears throat> so in this case the electrons are forced um, towards this side um, that is the cathode that is negative so the battery maintains a difference of potential that forces the electrons to go to the cathode to um, perform the reduction and is pulling out electrons um, <clears throat> because it's, it's on the positive side. So there is um, a driving force to pull out the electrons from the anode, that's the positive in the electrolytic cells, and that is um, where the oxidation is going to happen. So in this example, you have a bar, um, the anode is a bar of copper that has impurities of other materials. And so the electrolytic, um, the electrolytic cell is used to purify it. You oxidize the copper at the anode and then you re reduce it at the cathode. 
So in this case, it's important that the two solutions are mixing, right? Because at the anode, you have the oxidation of the copper. The copper is becoming copper plus two. It's moving around in the solution. It can reach the cathode. At the cathode, you have the reduction of copper plus two to metallic copper. So it goes um, to deposit on top of the um, <clears throat> on top of the um, cathode. So because um, if if the you know you you even if the impurities are other metals, but if you choose carefully the voltage, you may be uh, able to oxidize and reduce selectively copper. So everything else would just, as the, as the copper leaves uh, the anode, other impurities that are in, a, in the anode would just precipitate at the bottom of the, of the container. And um, so while the, um, the anode was... Um, and a bar that contain only a certain percentage of copper, the um, the cathode would be essentially pure copper. So even if it looks like you're moving in circle, the, the, uh, reducing and oxidizing the same material, the point is to make it purer. So let's see some more example of electrolytic cells. Uh, in this case, this is an electrolytic cell to perform, that's set up to perform the electrolysis of water, so the decomposition of water is into its element. Um, this is the opposite of what we've seen in fuel cells. In fuel cells, we are using the spontaneous combination of hydrogen and oxygen to form water to produce electricity. So that's a voltaic cell is spontaneous. This one is an electrolytic cell is not spontaneous. We need to provide energy to the reverse reaction. Um, that is the decomposition of water into the elements. So um, we know that is a, um, an electrolytic cell because we see the symbol of the battery here. And so this tells you that is a non spontaneous reaction for which we need to provide energy. Now, generally, um, so when the, in the symbology of the battery, the longest side is the positive and the shortest is the negative. And also there is a convention that the connection to the, um, that's not respected here, but typically the connection to the plus is a, um, a red wire and the connection to the minus is a black wire, but that's not what this particular uh, uh, picture shows. But we know which one is negative and positive, so it's no big deal. So on uh, the positive side is the anode in an electrolytic cell. That's the opposite of a voltaic cell. In a voltaic cell, negative is the anode, positive is the cathode. In an electrolytic cell, it's the opposite. The positive is the anode. It's positive because we want the oxidation to happen at the anode, so we need to extract uh, forcibly electrons from the species because that species doesn't want spontaneous to be oxidated. Instead, in a, um, voltaic cells, the anode is negative because that's a spontaneous reaction where the electrons are given off spontaneously from the species at the anode, therefore the anode is rich of electrons. Okay, so the sign is the opposite, but what's happening is the same. It doesn't matter if it's a voltaic cells or an electrolytic cell, electrolytic cells, the oxidation is always at the anode, an ox, and the reduction is always at the cathode, a red cat. So what else can we see here? Um, this is it's really easy to set up. It can be done uh, with normal household um, let's say supplies. So the battery can be a nine volt batteries, those rectangular ones that you have in the smoke alarm. And then you need a container with water and to um, increase the conductivity, um, the, electric the electrical conductivity, you may dissolve some table, um, some table salt into the water. And then you can collect the two gases that you're forming by using, by setting up upside down test tubes. And this is also a neat way to demonstrate that you collect twice as much hydrogen as oxygen because the ratio of the two in the water molecule is two to one. So you can see the two alpha reaction um, so uh, that are written as, um, uh, if, you, if you go on the um, um, on the so these are the reactions that are happening at the cathode and at the anode. At the cathode you have the reduction, so that's the same reaction 
that you would find on the table of standard potential. At the anode, you're having an oxidation. So the reaction that you're look, you when you look up for the reaction in the table, you need to look for the reverse reaction because in that table, all the reactions are written as um, reductions. So I go and check the, the table and I um, find that the potential for uh, formation of hydrogen is um, uh, zero, uh, minus uh, 0 83 volt. You might be confused because I told you that the hydrogen is taken as a reference and therefore you might expect that the potential should be zero. But if you look the way that reaction is written, that uh, is uh, for um, H plus reducing to H2. And because we are in standard condition, that means one molar H plus. So that would be a solution with a pH um, of a zero. So that would be an acidic solution. This is not the case. Uh, the, when we start, the water is neutral. The standard potential for the reduction of um, oxygen is plus 123. So when we put them together to figure out the standard potential of this cell, it's going to be cathode minus anode. So it's minus 0.83 minus plus 123, so we get a negative 2.06. So the negative value is because the reaction is not spontaneous. So here is not, there is a, there is a fundamental difference when you do the math, right? If it's a voltaic cells, um, the cathode is, all, because the reaction is spontaneous, the potential of the cell needs to come up positive. And, and the only way to do that is that the cathode is going to be the species with the higher value and the anode is going to be the species with the lower value. Here is different. Here you look at the reaction that you want to perform and based on that, you know that the cathode, you know which one is the cathode. And, and that determines um, the order in which you, you put these two numbers in the formula. And you're coming up with a negative because... Um, uh, it's a non-spontaneous reaction. This is another example of electrolysis. This is the electrolysis of potassium iodide. And as it happens, it's the one that's um, presented in the lab that you have to... When, so remember, when you are going through the electrochemistry lab, that you have this explanation here in these slides. Um, uh, when we were performing this, uh, the electro, electrochemistry um, experiment, let's say traditionally in the lab setting, uh, you guys were asked to put together a bunch of voltaic cells, measure with the voltmeter the, um, electrical the electric potential that was generated, then do the math with the standard potential of reduction, and compare the theoretical with the experimental, and then do some manipulation. And at the end of the lab, there was a demonstration of this reaction, that's electrolysis. Um, in, in, in the virtual lab, you will still, <clears throat> although virtually, putting together the voltaic cells, and then you're going to watch a YouTube video this shows you the electrolysis of potassium iodide. So, <clears throat> um, in, this, in the experimental setup that they use in this video, they are using a YouTube, um, so a, not, not the channel, the, the online thing, the, an actual tube shaped as a U, that is filled with a solution of potassium iodide. There is no separation between the two half cells. It's really not necessary, so it can be skipped. And, and then also the, they add um, some, um, some drops of uh, phenolphthalein. Now, you remember phenolphthalein is an indicator that is colorless in a, a neutral solution and turns pink when the solution becomes basic. Uh, in this case, we have a solution of Ki, that's a salt that is neutral because it's the result of combina combining a strong base, potassium hydroxide, with a strong acid, um, Hi, so the salt per se is neutral. So phenolphthalein, initially the solution will be colorless. 
we need to provide electrical energy because this is an electrolytical cell. That means the reaction is not spontaneous. We need to provide energy through a generator of continuous uh, voltage. Um, so in the generator, you see that the, uh, you have the indication of the signs, the negative, that in an electrolytic cell is going to be the cathode, and the positive, that is an electrolytic cell is going to be the anode. Uh, it's important in the video that you look carefully um, in, in order to be able to identify which one is the plus and which one is the minus side. Um, just a reminder that voltaic cells, the anode is negative and the cathode is positive. Electrolytic cells, the anode is positive and the cathode is negative. What stays the same in both type of cells is that at the anode, you always have the oxidation. At the cathode, you always have the reduction. So what, what would you see? After a while that the reaction is taking place, you could see that the side, uh, the car at the cathode, you see the appearance of a um, pink coloration um, the, that tells you that the solution is turning basic. And you may also see bubbles. Uh, the bubbles are, um, can be potentially proven as being uh, hydrogen. You remember there are tests in the lab that you can do. Uh, for uh, to test for hydrogen, for example, you could go with a um, splint uh, with a flame and you would hear it pop sound. Now, it's kind of hard here that there's not um, enough hydrogen to, to prove that, but that's hydrogen. On the anode side, you see like a brown fluid that tends to settle uh, towards the bottom um, of the tube. I forgot to mention that the electrodes are inert electrodes. You don't want other reaction to take place. So in this case, they are graphite. In our lab um, setup, we use uh, copper. That's a relatively that's a, that's a metal that is quite resistant to um, uh, oxidation. And at the same time, the electrode needs to be a good conductor of electricity. So both graphite and copper would work well. So what are the reactions that are taking place? At the cathode, you have the reduction of hydrogen uh, from water. So um, taking away the hydrogen from the water, you're left with the OH minus, and that explains why the phenolphthalein is turning pink. So if we go on the um, table of standard potential reduction, we can find the value for this, that is minus 0 0.83, exactly as for the electrolysis of water. At the anode, we have the oxidation, so um, just a clarification on the names. This here, I minus, is iodide ion. I2 is iodine, the element. Um, so this is getting oxidized because it goes from minus 1 to 0. And the standard reduction potential is 0, 54. So once again, the reaction is an oxidation reaction, but the potential is the potential for the reduction. So if you go on the table, this particular reaction is going to be flipped because all the reaction in that table are written as reductions. Um, so we have potentially other reactions that could happen, right? So we've seen in the electrolysis of water that we could also oxidize the oxygen and mixing oxygen gas. How come here we don't have oxygen gas? Um, we also have potassium ion. How come um, we don't reduce the potassium ions? So, so the answer is in the standard potential of reduction. It is true that we don't have a uh, standard condition because potassium and iodide are not one molar. That would be the concentration required for standard condition to be there. But still, comparison of the values of the uh, different reaction that could happen at the same ele electrode te are telling us which one is the easier to be reduced. So because this reaction is not spontaneous and we are forcing electrons sort of going uphill, they are going to follow the path of lower resistance. So they are going to reduce the species that's easier to reduce. So you are going to pick the reaction. The reaction that's going to happen is the one that is less expensive in terms of voltage. So um, the higher <clears throat> is the value, the more positive 
uh, is the value of the standard potential of reduction, the easier is to reduce that species. So between these two, we can tell that the easier to be reduced is hydrogen. So potassium is not getting reduced. Potassium is at the very bottom of that uh, table, so it's really, really hard to reduce uh, potassium. <clears throat> On the other side, which one is easier to oxidize, iodide or oxygen? So um, in this case, we need to remember that what's happening is an oxidation. So the species that's going to be the easiest to be oxidized is going to be the hardest um, to be reduced, right? So between the two, the hardest to be reduced is going to be iodine because it has the lower value. And because of that, it's going to be easier to be oxidized. So this combination between these four reactions, um, the two that are happening are the reduction of hydrogen and the oxidation of iodine. If we do the math to see how much this is costing us in terms of voltage, right, we see that this is a combination for which we get the lower value. Um, if we try to substitute either this minus, almost minus three, in here, or if we try to, um, in place of 0 0.83, or if we try to substitute plus 123 in place of plus 0 0.54, we wouldn't necessarily end up with a higher voltage. And so that's not going to happen. So what if I want to, um, what if I want to um, reduce sodium to make solid sodium? And I want to ox um, oxidize um, chlorine to make chlorine gas, right? Can I do that by dissolving, um, by applying a current to a solution of table salt? That would be a very cheap solution, right? Actually, <clears throat> when I show you the hydro hydrolysis of water, I told you that to um, enhance the conductivity of the solution, we can use table salt. So obviously, that react the fact that in that reaction we make hydrogen and oxygen and not sodium and chlorine is telling you that um, this is not going to work, right? Why is it not going to work? So if we want to obtain um, those two products, we would have uh, to oxidize the chlorine at the anode. The oxidation has always to happen at the anode. And we would have to reduce the sodium at the cathode. So we need to see what are the requirements in terms of voltage. Uh, sodium is pretty hard to um, reduce, um, so it has a very negative voltage. And chlorine, uh, conversely, has quite a positive voltage, meaning it's, it's really easy to reduce, but we are trying to oxidize it, so we're going to have a hard time. So if we put together those two reactions, we see that we end up with quite a demanding um, electrolytical reaction for which the voltage is uh, required that has to be applied is very negative and quite high in absolute value. If we try to perform this solution in uh, while the salt is dissolving water, we would have two competing reactions. There are the oxidation of um, oxygen and the reduction of hydrogen, so the hydrolysis of water basically that we see initially, and we know that's what's going to happen. Because for those, the potential are more uh, convenient. So the reduction of hydrogen uh, has a much lower value. So it's easier to reduce. Um, and oxygen, it's harder to, re to reduce. That means it's easier to oxidize, right? So we end up f um, that the, um, as, we, as we've seen the math for the hydrolysis of water, um, was still, you know, requiring energy, but it was only minus 2.06 volt as opposed to minus 4 volts. So it's almost uh, half of it. Um, so if we try to uh, perform the electrolysis of sodium chloride uh, dissolved in water, we are ending up with oxygen and hydrogen, not solid sodium and uh, gaseous chloride. Now, what can we do if we actually want those two products. So for the sodium, it's really, really the difference, uh, the disadvantage of the reduction of sodium respect to hydrogen 
it's really daunting it's really a lot so there's really not much that we can do there we need just really to have a completely different approach but for chlorine the difference is not terrible right and we need to remember that these are the values for standard condition when the concentration are one molar for both so maybe if we play we, we put ourselves in non-standard condition and we increase uh, the amount of chlorine so remember that this is the reduction uh, the reaction written as a reduction for chlorine so what we are actually trying to achieve is the opposite reaction is the oxidation of chlorine so chlorine ions is the reactant so if we increase a lot the concentration of the reactant uh, we may um, move the reaction in a way that the, the if you do the math with NERST equation the potential would be lower so we may be able to lower this value until it gets lower than 1.23 in which case chlorine could be produced instead of oxygen so this is done uh, in this uh, type of uh, setup that uh, a process that's called the electrolysis of brine so, or chlorine soda process uh, or soda alkali process that was um, developed and patented in the late 1800s um, so basically you use a very high um, a solution of sodium chloride with a very high concentration so brine so it's 26 percent of sodium chloride so that means that basically you have a solution in which one quarter is salt and three quarter is water um, the two so you have at the anode as usual the oxidation um, the anode is going to be the positive right so you can see the signs here uh, positive for the anode, negative for the cathode. The cathode is made of steel, the anode is made of graphite. And there is a separation between the two alpha cells uh, with a membrane that is permeable to sodium ion but not to chlorine and not to sodium hydroxide, to the hydroxide ion. So sodium ion can go. Uh, through it so what's happening is that at the anode you have the oxidation of chlorine that prevails over oxygen because it's so much more concentrated um, the chlorine being a gas is going to uh, you know uh, can be collected on, on the upper part of this of the device while um, the uh, the solution would uh, becomes uh, would become positive because of due to the uh, loss of chloride ions. So because the solution is uh, becoming more and more positive, um, that would uh, create um, a problem into the, into the reaction. And so sodium will on the other end on the other side, uh, you have the reduction of a hydrogen so this is going to leave behind OH minuses so the reaction on this side is becoming more and more negative so sodium ions are drawn uh, into this direction and are keeping the solution neutral so um, on this side you are producing a uh, quite pure uh, sodium hydroxide and on the other side you are producing pure chlorine so this is an industrial method that um, that's how pretty much 90% of the chloride is produced. Um, and uh, you can also um, mix them afterwards. Uh, if you mix the chlorine with the sodium hydroxide, you would produce bleach, so sodium hypochlorite. So that's the, the, one of the major, uh, the most common way to produce bleach. Um, so this is a, this is a way, but I still haven't, so I have solved the, the problem of being able to produce chloride um, gas, but I do not have a way to produce sodium because it's, um, it just, it, it's just too negative that reduction. So if I want to produce sodium chloride, um, if I want to produce solid metallic sodium, I need to eliminate completely water. So I need to eliminate completely the possibility of hydrogen being reduced. And this is done by uh, performing the electrolysis in molten sodium chloride. 
Solid sodium chloride is not a good conductor of electricity as any ionic compound, but if it's molten and the ions can move, um, you have a good conductor of electricity, so you can perform the electrolysis. Now, that requires quite elevated temperature. Uh, in this solution, you, uh, the sodium that's produced is melted, um, and so you can collect liquid, uh, liquid uh, sodium. Um, and you can also collect the uh, gas uh, chlorine that is formed. Um, and so that's the only way to make uh, solid sodium. So it's quite, quite. A so let's see some example of um, problems where you have to do calculation related to electrolysis. These problems are typically referred to as electroplating problems. So there are two conversion factors that you need to keep in mind. Um, in this problem, typically, um, you have a certain amount of uh, metallic ion that you want to transform into the solid metal. Um, and either because you're purifying the metal or because you want to cover, um, so to electroplate with the metal, another piece of metal. So, um, and typically these problems are given in terms of how much current would you need to do a certain job or how much time it would take. So there are two conversion factors that you need to keep in mind. One is the fact that amperes are coulomb per second. So the current in amperes corresponds to the number of coulombs delivered in one second. Um, the other is uh, that uh, when you write balanced equation, you know many electrons are required to reduce a certain metallic ion. But then the current is in coulomb, so you need a conversion between your, um, coulomb and electrons. So it takes uh, 96,000 electrons, more or less, to make one coulomb. And that conversion factor is called the Faraday constant. So F is for the initial of Faraday that was a, a British physicist who studied electricity. So, for example, this is a setting. We have um, we are purifying aluminum uh, from a melt. So aluminum is going to be liquid um, using um, a current of five ampere for two hours. And how many grams of aluminum can be extracted given that time and given that much um, current? So the first thing you want to do is write the equation for the um, uh, reduction of the aluminum. And this highlight the fact that for each aluminum ion in the liquid state, um, you need to add three electrons. Um, then you need to be very patient, and these problems are better solved by a neat organization of conversion factors. So let's follow this se um, sequence of conversion one at a time. So first of all, we start from the amount of hours, uh, the amount of time we have, that's in hours, but as we've seen, the ampere is in seconds, it's coulomb per second. So we need to convert from hour to um, minutes and from minutes to second. So it's 60 minutes in an hour and 60 seconds in one minute. You may think I shouldn't have to say that, but you wouldn't believe um, how common is to have problems with this conversion? Um, so it's going to be 3,600 seconds in an hour. So by doing that, uh, we have eliminated the hour and we have now seconds. So uh, for this, um, now we want to uh, figure out in that many seconds how many coulomb we can extract, given that we have an amperage of five amperes, so five coulomb per second. So five coulomb per seconds, um, seconds and seconds go away. So we want to multiply by five and divide by one. At this point, we have the total amount of coulombs. Now we want to convert from coulombs to electrons. So we're going to use the Faraday constant. Often time is rounded to uh, 96, uh, 500. Just use whatever it's given in the cover of the test because it's typically given. So you have Coulomb and Coulomb um, goes away, and so you you end up with how many uh, the moles of electrons that you have delivered uh, with the five ampere current applied for two hours. 
Now, with that many moles of electrons, you need to divide by three because um, the mole, the ratio between electrons and moles of aluminum is um, three to one. Finally, at this point, you have the moles of aluminum. You need to use the atomic mass of aluminum to convert from moles to grams. And so the result would be 3.36 grams of aluminum. Electric work and voltage. So if we, uh, we need to remember that the units are for volts, so the uh, difference in voltage is measuring volts. And that corresponds to the joules divided the coulomb. So we have uh, work divided charge give us the, the voltage. So if you rearrange that and you multiply the uh, volts times the um, coulomb, you can get the uh, work uh, performed by the, um, by the, for example, the voltaic cells in joules. So one joules is the amount of work that is required or produced, depending if the reaction is spontaneous or not, when um, the charge that corresponds to one coulomb, it's uh, transferred between two points uh, that are at a difference in between which there is a potential difference of one volt. And this conversion is given in the coulomb. So in thermochemistry, we learn to give a sign, positive or negative, to uh, work. When work is done by the system onto the surrounding, that's negative because um, the system is losing energy. When work is done by the surrounding onto the system, that's energy gained by the system. Therefore, um, th that work is going to be positive because the perspective is always from the system. However, this is kind of in conflict with the sign we have uh, given to the voltage in electrolytic cells because voltaic cells that are spontaneous, so they are producing work that's going from the system, the chemical reaction, into the surrounding. So that's work that is negative, but we have assigned a positive sign to that voltage. Vice versa, um, if you think about uh, electrolytical cells, those are non-spontaneous. Uh, the surrounding needs to provide energy, like from a generator in, or from a battery, into the uh, system to make the non-spontaneous reaction to happen. So that is, uh, we are adding energy to the system, so that work is positive. However, the voltage that we measure for, for that cells is going to be negative. So we need to add a minus sign to make um, the two um, convention in agreement. So um, as we have seen in the other slide, voltage, uh, the voltage of a cell is sometimes referred to with the acronym EMF, electromotive force. So the work and the voltage are going to have opposite sign. Um, remember that um, the voltage is joules uh, divided uh, coulomb, so by multiplying the voltage by the coulomb, we get the amount of joules produced by the reaction. Um, uh, if we also, if we are reasoning in terms of number of electrons, then we need to uh, use the uh, Faraday constant to convert from um, electrons. So at the end of the day, the formula that you need to remember and that's given uh, in the cover is the following. That connects the free energy associated with um, the electrical uh, work. So if the reaction is spontaneous, delta G uh, needs to be uh, negative, right? Um, as we learn uh, in thermodynamic, um, that's going to be equal to the electromotive force, so the voltage of the cell. So if the reaction is spontaneous, this is going to be a plus. F is the Faraday constant, so we, that we can reason in terms of electrons, and N is the number of moles that are exchanged during the reaction. So for example, for copper plus two being reduced, N would be equal to two. For aluminum plus three being reduced, that would be N would be equal to three and so forth. Um, and the minus is to make an agreement between the sign of the two reaction. 
So the potential of the cell, uh, the standard potential of the cell is, as we have seen, the difference between the potential of the cathode and the potential of the anode. So this is just, uh, you know, showing you the relationship within the, the size. So for voltaic galvanic cells, the reaction is spontaneous. The uh, standard cell potential is going to be positive. Um, then delta G is coming negative, that's consistent with the spontaneous reaction. And the, the other way around, if you have a, an electrolytical cell. So this equation is used to convert from... Um, standard free energy and uh, potential of the cell. Um, so you want to calculate in standard condition the value of delta G um, for the reaction between magnesium and copper. So in this case, you have copper being reduced, uh, and so being the cathode, and magnesium being oxidized and being the anode. And as you will see in the lab, this is a spontaneous reaction. The reason being that the standard potential of copper is higher, so it's going to be the cathode, while the standard potential of magnesium is lower and is going, therefore is going to be the anode. Um, so you can calculate the uh, through the formula delta G equal minus NF um, times the um, standard cell potential. You can calculate the standard cell potential. Uh, by going cathode minus anode. So it's going to be 0 0.34 minus minus 2.37, so it's going to be uh, 2.71 volts. And then you multiply by two moles of electrons because in the balanced equation, n is equal to 2. So that's the same n you would use for the nurse equation. And then you multiply by the Faraday constant um, to convert from Coulomb to electrons. So you get uh, minus 523 kilojoules. So that tells you that the reaction is spontaneous because delta G is negative. Because you've been using standard cell potential, you are calculating the standard free energy. So, um, so this, we have already seen the relationship between K and um, delta G. Now, the G standard. Now we have seen the relationship between uh, standard delta G of reaction and the potential of the cell, and consequently there has to be a relationship between the cell potential and the equilibrium constant. That is the following. And I typically put this very same triangle uh, in the uh, cover of uh, your um, exam. So that means that uh, if I have a K that's very big, so that would be this, this situation in the middle, um, the delta G is going to be uh, very negative. The logarithm of K is going to be a positive number. So the delta G to zero is going to be uh, negative. So that means that in standard condition, um, I have a <coughs> spontaneous reaction. Uh, that means that the cell potential is going to be very negative. Um, that means that the reaction is spontaneous. Um, we can now uh, finish the unit by talking about corrosion. Corrosion is a galvanic process, so it's a spontaneous process that is just uh, most of the time um, unwelcome. Um, and it refers to the deterioration of metal um, because of oxidation. So it's what you would call rusting in the instance of iron. So what we uh, refers to rust is pretty much uh, iron oxide, where iron has, is higher oxidation number that would be plus three. For copper, for example, the oxidation um, produces uh, several compounds, carbonate, sulfate, depending on the uh, environment. Uh, that has different shades between blue and green, and so they give the, co the characteristic color to the patina, patina of copper, just think to the Statue of Liberty color. Uh, in the case of silver, for example, the oxidation produces silver oxide that is kind of black, uh, dark in color, so that would be the patina that you would see on um, actual silverware made of silver. 
Um, there are several uh, conditions, as you might be aware, by living in Wisconsin and due to the la large amount of salt that we throw on the streets to melt ice in winter, we are familiar with the, um, uh, with the fact that the cars uh, tend to rust much more quickly. And, um, and that's because of the presence of water and the presence of electrolytes, they make the water a good conductor. And a particular specific issue with corrosion is when two different metals are in contact. Um, that's called galvanic corrosion. So, for example, at the point of soldering, because two different metals would have different uh, standard uh, potential of reduction. So one is always going to be more prone to reduction and the other one is going to be more prone to oxidation. So that kind of generates uh, spon uh, spontaneous local um, electrochemical reaction. Um, so in this example, you can see this um, inside a Petri dish. They have an iron um, nail that's been surrounded by with a copper wire. And so the presence of the copper makes the uh, rusting of the iron nail much faster because um, uh, the creation of a galvanic uh, couple where uh, the uh, copper is the cathode and the iron is the anode. Now this can be taken advantage of in cathodic protection. So for example, if I want to protect a structure that's made of iron, obviously if I have copper nearby, I'm making the uh, oxidation faster. But if I put something else that is more prone to oxidation than that iron, so I should need, instead of uh, pairing iron with copper, that has a standard potential that's higher, I should pair iron with something like magnesium that has a lower um, standard potential of reduction. In which case, that would make iron being the cathode, Therefore, if anything, what's happening at the cathode is a reduction, so this would protect um, the iron. And then the magnesium would become the anode and would be sacrificed, um, it would be like... Um, would be sacrificed and would oxidize uh, and would have to be obviously eventually uh, so, you know, re replenished when, once it is completely used up. Um, so this is called passive galvanic cathodic protection. Um, and uh, I have a picture afterwards to show you, but sometimes when that uh, is not possible because let's say the, the iron um, structure is too big, um, then you can actually uh, apply the constant um, electric, uh, constant um, difference of voltage in order to keep the um, the iron uh, positive, so it's the, it's the cathode. So this is an example of cathodic protection where you can see that the main structure is steel, and then you have all those bars of aluminum. Aluminum is more prone to uh, oxidation than iron is, and so all those little bars um, are going to protect the the Statue of Liberty represents a good example of problem created by corrosion. Um, in the 80s, the statue undergo, underwent um, substantial uh, work of repairs um, due to the corrosion that was um, taking place. Uh, the Statue of Liberty, as a, the, the exterior part, is copper, but inside there is a supporting structure, so to speak, a skeleton of iron. Um, and it was built by the same, by the, it was the, the design was by the French engineer Eiffel, the same of the Tour Eiffel. And he was, a, he was aware that uh, combining iron and copper would have created issue eventually. The reason uh, of the issue is the difference in the uh, standard reduction potential between the two metals. Copper has a much higher uh, standard uh, reduction potential. So it being the one that has the higher tendency to be reduced, it's going to be the cathode and iron is going to be the anode. So at the, wherever there is a contact between the two, electrons can go from uh, iron to copper and therefore um, you see the, the formation of rust uh, in the vicinity. So 
um, there is a net uh, voltage of zero, uh, almost zero eight volt. Um, so to avoid this, in the original design of the Statue of Liberty, the iron was painted with a shellac. Uh, but over the, the years, so as it, you know, it was some, so many years ago, that um, the painting has deteriorated, exposing the iron, and the iron started to show a significant amount of rusting. And uh, therefore, they had to uh, go through this um, massive restoration, and they uh, to isolate the iron from the copper, they, they, they introduced a plastic. Uh, material so that there is no electrical contact and therefore there cannot be a transfer of the electron that was the cause of the oxidation of iron. So this picture represents you the mechanism by which you um, have rust forming. So rust is due to the reaction between iron and oxygen. However, you need water for the reaction to happen. So the the a, a way, um, a wet, even if water is not the reactant, um, but the, a wet environment, um, especially in the presence of uh, strong electrolytes dissolving the water, they would make that water a um, good conductor of electricity, that favors the reaction between iron and oxygen. And so, of course, the salt thrown into the streets, then melting the snow, creates this um, highly concentrated solution that is a good conductor of electricity. So um, you have um, the, the, so let me get the pointer. So you would have an anodic side, that's where the iron gets uh, oxidized, and it gets uh, initially oxidized to iron plus two. Iron plus two is soluble and so again can go into the solution in the water uh, solution, while the electrons that cannot move in the water, they will move in the metallic. The metallic will act the, the metal will act as a good conductor. And uh, they will um, move to the cathodic side that's going to be a site at the periphery of the water bubble where there is more oxygen dissolved. So the idea is that there is less oxygen in the central area of this hypothetical uh, drop of water um, because oxygen dissolves from the air into the water, so it's more concentrated at the, at the surface of the uh, water drop rather in, and less concentrated in the, in the body of the water drop. So the electrons would move elsewhere where it's close to the edges and there where there is more oxygen, um, they would react with the oxygen. So the oxygen will um, be oxidized to um, uh, um, oxidation state of minus two. Um, the rust, uh, the iron plus two, will also react with oxygen uh, to the edges, uh, close to the edges, for, uh, getting further oxidized to iron three plus, that is what, what makes rust. And therefore, so the, the, the consequence is that the rust may not necessarily accumulate in the point where you have the deterioration of the material. So, and this shows you that the, uh, where, where you see the rust in the structure of the car may be quite far away from, um, uh, from the anodic side. So normally, the, the, for example, the, the iron frame of a car would be protected by paint. So this pinkish layer represents paint. So if you have a, a little scratch uh, here and a little scratch there, uh, they expose the iron. So um, uh, even if the two scratches are quite far away from each other, um, because of the good c uh, conductivity of iron, they, one may act as an anode and one may act as a cathode. Um, so you have, um, so you see the accumulation of iron in this area of the car, while the damage in the structure is just uh, far away. And so, depending on the relative amount of oxygen, you would have that the anodic side is the one where you have less oxygen, and the cathodic cathodic side is the one where you have more availability of a higher concentration of oxygen. In certain instances, the oxidation can be um, regarded as useful. 
So um, if you look at the uh, standard potential of reduction, you will see that aluminum is pretty low as value, so that would mean that aluminum is oxidized quite easily. However, in our common everyday experience, we can see that which iron seems to have more issue than aluminum, right? So uh, I, something made of iron left outside is going to rust pretty quickly. Um, aluminum um, seems more resistant despite the fact that the um, standard potential of reduction is so low. That's because of the mechanical characteristic of the oxide that are different. So in the case of iron, uh, rust is very brittle and has a very um, irregular sort of texture. So <clears throat> when you're forming a rust on the surface of iron, uh, this rust is very porous and the uh, oxygen can still go in depth and so and water and uh, so the, the, the corrosion just keep going um, into the body of the mass and of, of iron. Uh, for aluminum, instead, aluminum oxide, that's kind of a light gray or, um, color, and you may notice it when you accidentally put something made of aluminum in the dishwasher, get oxidized due to the um, aggressivity of the dishwasher soap. And so it gets a kind of a whitish patina. Uh, and that's not particularly good because uh, that means that there are aluminum ion instead of aluminum metallic, metallic aluminum. And aluminum ion may, to some extent, dissolve in the food. So then if you're using those, you know, kitchen tools, um, you may actually be ingesting, um, although minimal, but a certain amount of aluminum ion. So it's not an ideal uh, thing. But <clears throat> aluminum oxide is very thin and is very uh, compact. And so it forms um, um, a layer that protects uh, the rest of the aluminum that's underneath. So it's like a sort of a natural varnish. And so this process is called passivation. So here you see that uh, the formation of, a, uh, of an oxide layer on top of the aluminum metal protects that metal that underneath from further oxidation. And this is the um, effect that you see in certain, so that's what is called um, anodized aluminum. So sometimes that oxidation is uh, created on purpose to protect aluminum. And the special effect that the uh, Mac uh, laptop you know, that special coloration is due to uh, um, a passivation uh, uh, of, the, of the aluminum case that obviously being done industrially is done to achieve a certain aesthetic value, but basically is passivated.